The story of foreign trade is a story that is most important to the vital problems of nationalism and internationalism. Countries striving for their own economic advantage, but wishing for global understanding and peace. For centuries, foreign trade has been the subject of arguments, articles, books, speeches. Foreign trade is the key to prosperity. Free trade will bring on a great depression. A high tariff policy will lead to war. We must protect our standard of living from the competition of cheap foreign labor. Sometimes in this great rich country of ours, it must seem we can build anything, that we can grow anything, that we have everything. We feel powerful, prosperous. We feel we can trade with the whole world or not as we wish. But is trade, two-way trade, important to our nation and to the entire world? Well, let's look at the world. Here are the people of the earth. They represent the work of the world and the markets of the world. Not very evenly distributed, are they? And here are the industrial areas where people produce goods, generally different goods in different countries. Not evenly spread around the world here either. And the resources used by these people in these industries, they are unevenly distributed. So as the world of nations becomes more interdependent, across the trade lanes move certain goods from the countries producing more than they can use to other countries whose people want and need these things. And don't forget the so-called invisibles, the investments and services, such as insurance, shipping, and travel, which also can be considered as exports and imports. All right, is foreign trade as simple as that? Well, let's see. Let's take one example. When one factory exports tractors to Brazil, in the office of the export manager, perhaps we can see what makes foreign trade different from domestic trade, the rather free, unhampered trade within our borders. In the morning mail is an order, an order from a company in Brazil, South America, for tractors. Can we just ship the tractors right out as we might for a domestic order? No, there are government barriers to international trade. Here's one, the import license, an import control of the Brazilian government. Let's see about these controls. Brazil and many other nations control the foreign spending of their people. If the people continually sent out more funds than came in, their country might lose its monetary reserves. So the government encourages home consumption and discourages use of certain foreign goods. The government may, in effect, put up a wall of controls to limit foreign spending. Through import licensing, the government restricts the importing of certain items. For example, the Brazilian government issues a license for the import of tractors only when it considers tractors essential to its economy. Another form of control, an indirect control, is the tariff, a special tax. Often, the government charges a tariff or duty on imported goods. This makes foreign goods more expensive, discouraging some imports, and may also provide revenue for the government. A third government control is exchange control. The Brazilian government approved the use of dollars to pay for tractors, and dollars earned by Brazilians must be sold to the government. So import licensing, tariffs, and exchange control are three of the many ways a government limits its imports. Here is the arrangement for financing the sale of the tractors. In this case, a bank letter of credit by which the factory can be paid in dollars. How does this international payment work? You see, the Brazilian buyer must pay in cruzeiros to his bank for a letter of credit in dollars at the prevailing rate of exchange. 
Through the transfer of exchange by the banks, the United States factory can be paid in dollars when the importer in Brazil has only cruzeiros to spend. Now, what do we need to export these tractors? Besides the invoices and other documents specified in the shipping instructions, there may have to be an export license by which our government may control the amount and destination of certain goods that leave this country and an export declaration for the statistical records of our government. And so we've seen some of the controls by governments over the exports which leave the country and over the imports which come into the country. After the transportation, financing, and documents are coordinated, the tractors move onto a train for the first stage of their journey to the buyer in Brazil. But selling United States goods in another country is only half of the story. In general, the rest of the world can buy from us only to the extent that we buy something from them, from all of them put together. Let's follow the tractors to Brazil and see about that. Brazil is a large, rich country, about the size of the United States. What does Brazil have to sell? Well, they have many things, but coffee is the most important. Remember the tractor deal, Cruzeiros to the Brazilian bank, letter of credit to the U.S., payable in dollars in the U.S. for the tractors. Well, the export of coffee from Brazil to the U.S. works just the other way around. Dollars to a U.S. bank, letter of credit to Brazil, which is turned into cruzeiros to pay for the coffee. This is an example of bilateral trade, almost in effect trading tractors for coffee. But it takes both sides of the story to make the whole thing work. In multilateral trade, more than two countries are involved. In a simple example, U.S. tractors might go to Brazil, the Brazilian coffee to England, and English textiles to the U.S. Foreign exchange, representing money, goes the other way and the balance of trade is accomplished on a triangular base. Sometimes the balance is disrupted when governments impose trade restrictions, as when certain industries request protection, perhaps by a tariff wall, protection from foreign competition. What about the competition of foreign labor? Do U.S. workers lose their jobs when goods are imported? Well, these people in foreign lands are labor competition, but they are also customers. For example, with this electric traveling crane, British workers may produce competitive goods, but perhaps parts of the crane were made in the U.S. Other countries buy from the U.S. more than one-third of our machine tools more than one-third of our baled cotton, and a good share of our milk, wheat, petroleum. Other countries buy these things from us, making jobs for U.S. workers. In today's world, there are many restrictions on foreign trade and many reasons for them. But the unequal distribution of people, industry, and resources tends to make world trade necessary. Raw materials, goods, and services move from nation to nation, meeting demands and raising the standard of living of everyone. From other countries come such things as asphalt for our roads, fertilizer for our farm crops, leather for our shoes. We may regard this tractor as a product of the United States, but parts of it came from at least half a dozen other countries. Investigate for yourself and see what you can find. What would the tractor be without foreign trade? Without tin, rubber, manganese? Look around you. You'll find many things that go to other countries, that come from other countries. 
Yes, look around you, and you'll find the importance of foreign trade.